Hi everyone, welcome back to AI News. I, this is Ethan. Today we have two amazing guests. Please help me, us to uh, introduce yourself a little bit. My name is Gary Cass. I'm a pastor. I pastor here in Escondido. I just started pastoring here a few months ago as the senior pastor. And uh, we're revitalizing a church that had kind of gone dead. And uh, so we're doing a lot of evangelism and outreach. And uh, excited to be able to speak to you today. I hope whatever we say might really edify you and honor Jesus. So my name is Troy Newman. I'm the president of Operation Rescue. We're a parachurch organization that reaches out to close abortion clinics, preach the love and grace of Jesus Christ to a lost world in the context of abortion. I've been serving God full-time ministry for 32 years. I've been saved for longer than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a pleasure to know Dr. Gary Cass, who was my pastor here many years ago when he pastored a church. Now it's great to have him back in the pulpit, and it's great to be here with you as well. Thank you. We just came back from Cal State University, oh. San Marcos. It's long. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you guys were doing there, uh, what we were doing there, and then uh, what's our message to these university students? This is the closest university to our church. And I've taught my church that we're responsible <laughs> for everything that's closest to us. I can't change the whole world, but I can impact my backyard. And this is the future. These kids are going to be the leaders. And then it occurred to me, I came to faith when I was exactly their age. And it just kind of put a burden on my heart. I went there a few months ago with another ministry called Justice for All. Mm -hmm. And we had some interesting conversation. I just went there to watch. But while I was there, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you got to have a presence on this, on this campus. So we're hoping to maybe be there, you know, maybe monthly or, or more frequently. And we went there today to discuss the future of abortion in America. That's why we brought Troy Newman, the, the leading expert on this topic, and a dear friend and, and courageous brother. And the whole idea is to use these hard, hot-button issues to expose them mm. to the God's law and God's gospel. And that's what we tried to do. Uh, this was our first attempt to do it. And uh, it, was, <laughs> it was a little bit, it, it, was, it was exciting. Eventually, it, at the beginning, it was kind of confounding. It didn't seem to be going anywhere. Then all of a sudden, it took off. While we were there, uh, Christians got encouraged. Um, unbelievers got confronted. Uh, and the gospel was clearly proclaimed a couple of times. So uh, it's, it's what we need to do. I, and pastors, there's probably a university not far from you. Why don't you go there and preach the gospel? And um, you know how to do that. It's sad. Most pastors on Sunday morning, they're, they're a tiger in the yeah, pulpit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then you say, hey, let's go outside and preach the gospel. And all of a sudden... They get intimidated. Be the John the Baptist. Go out and preach. I mean, look at the biblical history of, of open-air preaching. It's a wonderful means that God uses. So pastors, we encourage you to go. And we had the benefit of having an expert on the topic we chose, which was abortion. No better expert than Troy. And we're thinking, okay, what's the next issue? Because, you know, people want to come and watch things burn, right? They, yeah. they You have to create an opportunity and, an, and if you will, conflict. a conflict. And they'll show up for that. And they did eventually. And um, so we're trying to figure out what the next one might be. We're calling it Conversations That Matter. Uh -huh. And uh, we let them, we gave them mics. We had a small little PA system. Everybody can afford one now. And uh, we let them speak on the mic. Some of it was pretty colorful. Uh, <laughs> but we said we wanted it to be a dialogue. Yeah. And to a certain degree, we were successful. Yeah, the reason we come all the way down is to have a conversation because we know that there's a lot of churches that want to do something and they saw the filthiness and the, 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 the evil in the society. Mm -hmm. They want to do something to change it, but they don't know how. For example, like abortion and then all the LGBTQ agenda and uh, all the sex education in school. Mm -hmm. All these uh, parents have questions church supposed to lead people but they don't know what to do and i heard your your success story mm -hmm. about uh east san diego mm -hmm. is abortion free 
So uh, please tell us a little bit about your success story and how are we going to do that as a church? Beautiful. Well, I couldn't have done it without Troy. It's a team effort. If you're going to be successful, it's not going to be a one-man show. Uh, the truth is, this all kind of came together by God's goodness and kindness and providence. Nobody sat down and made a plan. It just, God blessed us. But the secret is, it started with a group of pastors praying every Thursday. And we got together and began to pray. Uh, at that point in East County, uh, this is at the height of the crystal meth uh, epidemic that had hit. Um, El Cajon was kind of a depressed little town with a lot of, lot of problems, a lot of crime. And um, the pastors said, you know what, we need to make a difference. And we began to pray, and it's a very simple pray. we, prayer. We were praying for God's kingdom, His rule, His will mm -hmm. to be done in El Cajon and in East County. So we started praying together every week for an hour. That was the only thing on the agenda. And then we became friends. You know, it's, it's sad. A lot of time pastors look at the church down the street as competition. Yes. And not as an ally. We only have one enemy, and it's the devil. Mm -hmm. And um, and I realized as I'm praying with these guys, I like them. They love the Lord. Mm. They're, we agree. And they have gifts I didn't have. And they had resources I didn't have. And we just started helping each other. Uh, some of the guys had a really significant youth ministry. Um, and so they did a, an outreach every summer for youth. And so we all helped them. Because nobody was doing it any better or more effective. Uh, we helped them. Uh, I felt inclined to run for office, and they helped me. And, but it wasn't just political. It's, it's the kingdom, mm -hmm. the reign of Christ in its fullness. Where, and over time, we were able to establish a Christian mayor, a Christian city council, we got a Christian chief of police who actually enforced the law. They did a whole redevelopment plan, mm -hmm. got all of the strip clubs and the porno stores off of Main Street in El Cajon, um, and just did some things to revitalize the community and establish the reign of Christ for the benefit of everybody. And even to this day, Mayor Wells is a dear friend. I helped uh, Bill uh, when he first ran for city council. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, the existing Mayor Lewis uh, had to step down, and we ran uh, Bill to take the office. He's a dear Christian believer, probably one of the smartest guys I've ever met, great, great man of God, great heart. And we've been able to keep a Christian majority there. We've got Christian majorities on the school boards. So what we're doing uh, all came out of a prayer meeting and there's no shortcuts to that. And so if you're a pastor and you're watching, it's gonna, it, the ball's in your court. Because now, when an open seat comes up, where do we go? We go to the pastors. Yeah. Say, hey, we need somebody for this, this position. Do you know anybody? And if you're qualified to lead in the church, if you, we just looked at those last week in our church, the, the qualifications for eldership in the church. If you can meet those criteria, no one does it perfectly, but if you substantially meet those criteria and you can lead in the church, you certainly are more than qualified to lead in the civic realm. Mm -hmm. So we need elders, we need the officers of the church to take their proper place, not only just sitting in, in oversight of the church, but in the Old Testament, the elders sat in the gates of the city. Yes, That right. was the moral authority. So we just... Didn't know any better but to try to do that, and God <laughs> blessed it. Wow. Yeah, and uh, about the Operation Rescue, right? I, I wasn't there in the 90s, but what I see from the videos are just a whole bunch of Christian and then the news media trying to make them into like crazy people. <laughs> they go like, oh, 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 look at all these people uh, kneeling down there praying, crazy, crazy Christians, and then they'll just get arrested. Right. And then the, the anchor will be like, oh, all these crazy Christians and they're religious activists. Da, 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 da. I think that's how they painted us. Right, sure. For the pro-life movement. Right. Well, back then we were crazy. 
Okay. We're crazy for Jesus. Yes. We were dead to ourselves. The, the premise was if abortion was murder, no. which it is, then we should act like it. We interposed ourselves, this doctrine of interposition, in between us and the abortionist, in between the baby who's going to die and the abortionist. So we sat down peacefully and we locked arms and oftentimes we were arrested. And, and as we're being hauled away, you know, the media would say, oh, look at those violent people. There's none of us that were violent. It was, it was actually the largest civil disobedience movement in our nation's history. Mm. All peaceful, 75,000 arrests for peaceful demonstration on behalf of the preborn child. The civil rights movement had at max 20,000 yeah. arrests. So we were by far the largest. But I think to answer your original question about we look at the LBGT movement or abortion or uh, any other anti-God thing that we're all broken hearted about, uh, uh, Francis Schaeffer, one of the famous theologians, uh, in 1980 wrote a book called The Christian Manifesto. And he said, we're wrong to think that all of these problems are just bits and pieces, but they're one whole problem. And that is the systematic worldview that's taking over right now and is the dominant worldview, and it's humanism. So no matter how you look at, look at it, uh, uh, it's all the same thing, man looking inside of himself mm -hmm. or around him and saying, this is all that there is. It's all that there's ever going to be. And there's no foundation for a moral law or a moral co code or to say something is right or wrong. So it's changed. It's all relativistic. It's subjective to whatever the society is. We can't say that killing the Uyghurs in China is bad or the Aztecs killing and eating people in South America is bad or Abortion is bad. It's just whatever's right for you. The Bible said, you know, people did what was right in their own eyes. We're looking at this as a holistic problem. There's bits and pieces. Abortion is definitely a hot button that it's very easy to lay out and to discuss. And people are very passionate about it. But when you drill down, we ask them, why is it their right or their ability to kill a child? And there's no answer for that. Yeah. Because they're at war with God. And that gives a segue into the gospel. And we've counseled so many women in front of abortion clinics. And to date, I just don't know of any of them that haven't saved their baby, agreed that killing a child is wrong, that haven't come to Christ in some way, mm -hmm. that come to a repentance. And major civil disobedience or civil rights movements in the country always start with my rights, me, 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 me. Yes. Operation Rescue always started on our knees. We're sorry. The problems in society today are mostly our problems. It started here. We took the Ten Commandments out of our own houses yes. before we took them out of the schools, took them out of our churches. We accepted abortion in our own households and our churches before. So we always started on our knees, said, Lord, forgive us, and now help us to go out into society and to be salt and light and pray according to Jesus' name. When he said, may his will be done on earth. Jesus taught us, may his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. That's our prayer. And we see that God answers those prayers. Yeah, a, like a lot of churches, a lot of pastors, they're saying like, don't talk about abortion. Don't talk about LGBTQ. Just, just pray about it. Just pray about it. You know, like don't civil op uh, disobedience. You know, and I'm, why, why are you guys doing in front of the abortion center? Roman 13 says, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I completely disagree. What's your message to those churches? He's a doctor, so he's really smarter than me. He but goes, the, the American Revolution <laughs> was predicated on Romans 13. And in a nutshell, if human beings can sin, which we can, then a government that is run by human beings can sin. A government that sins, that violates the law of God, abrogates its authority to rule its people. Mm -hmm. And then it's God's people's privilege and right to resist that government and make them conform to the will of God. I want to encourage pastors because here's the message that's also being sent. I got it last week in an email from somebody who's consulting with some of the largest churches in America. And they said, hey, here's how you pastor in America. First of all, essentially stay in your lane. You're not an expert on everything, so you don't have to have an opinion on everything. So what you need to do is focus on spiritual things, very narrowly defined spiritual things. That's your expertise. Although we're finding not very many pastors seem to have any 
uh, <laughs> willingness to take positions even on spiritual things, right? <laughs> yeah. There's all this equivocation and every argument, everything dies a death of a thousand qualifications. Well, I don't mean this, I don't mean... And there's no clear word of the Lord. And the good news is we have it. And the church always known it. And it's so simple. It's the law and the gospel. And we need to proclaim both. We need to proclaim the gospel because everybody needs Jesus. Everyone needs to know Christ to be saved. But there is one moral standard, and it's God and his law. And he is going to judge all men everywhere by that one standard. If I love my neighbor, maybe I should make them aware of that. There's a certain sense which they already know that. But part of what we did even today at the college was to appeal to the knowledge that God says in their heart they already know. The law of God's already written on their heart. That's why when we come with the message, thou shalt not murder babies, abortion is murder, why do they get so angry? Agreed, because right? it touches their, <laughs> their own conscience, afflicts them, because they know that they're suppressing that truth and unrighteousness. But that's our job. Yes. Our job is to proclaim the truth. There's three uses of the law. The first use of the law is to bring conviction of sin so that people might flee to Jesus and get saved. So if we're not preaching the law, we're not really doing evangelism. The Puritans called it the law work. They would argue you can't even be a Christian until you've had the law of God cut you off at the knees and wipe out any sense of self-righteousness that you might try to walk in. And the law, when it's rightly proclaimed, humbles us. Mm -hmm. So that's the first use of the law. Second use of the law is for Christians. We're supposed to love our neighbor. We're supposed to be holy as the Lord is holy. Okay, what does that look like? Well, God spelled it out. Here's what loving your neighbor looks like. And it's spelled out not only in love your neighbor and love God, not only walk humbly and do justice. Those are summaries of it. And then the Ten Commandments, a summary of it. But Jesus said we're supposed to teach all men everywhere everything that he commanded. So it's the whole law of God. God has given us the law so as Christians we can know what it looks like to be holy. Hmm. But there's a third use of the law that Paul speaks to Timothy about, 1 Timothy chapter 1, that the law is not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. Yes. See, as a Christian, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, and that empowers us to do what is right. It causes us to want to do what's right. Before I was a Christian, I didn't even want to do what's right. But now I want to do what's right. But there's a lot of people out there that will only do what's right if they know there's consequences if they don't. And so th those are the traditional, historic understanding of the three uses of the law. But I guarantee you, in most churches, they may preach the first use of the law to drive you to Christ. But then if you say, no, but there's other uses, you're accused of being a Pharisee. Yeah. You're a legalist. And so I need to urge our pastors, no, you need to preach the whole counsel of God. Law and gospel, you're not helping anybody by minimizing the moral law of God. The psalmist says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the souls. So why don't we use the perfect means that God has given us? Let's preach the law. Let them feel it. It was awkward today. People got angry, but that's between them and God. But we're not doing them any favors by not telling them the truth. So that's our job, and then let the Lord get the results. Perfect advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we want to do something. A lot of churches want to do something. We have a lot of pastors gather up together every month. They just pray over every issue, but they want to know what's next. What can the church do to stop abortion? What kind of action plan they can do? How do we do that? Well, Troy is the expert, literally. He wrote the book on it. All right. <laughs> Abortion-free abortion community projects. And to be honest, Troy is going to be speaking at our church here because the landscape has changed with the overturn of Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. That's opened up phenomenal things. But then in California, unfortunately, it's the passage of Proposition 1. So we're kind of looking at each other saying, okay, Lord, what's the next steps? I wish we could abolish abortion here in California, and that's our dream, and that's what we're aspiring to and are praying for. But in the meantime, we've got to act. So what do you think? I, like I said, I've been doing this for 32 years, and there's a lot of people that come to me and they want this silver bullet, this perfect, just if I do this one thing, yeah. it's all going to be fixed. And there is one thing. God says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's the gospel. Yes. So the first thing we do is we pray. And God says, if you ask for anything in his name, he's going to give it to you. So does God want abortion clinics to close? Absolutely. Of course. 
Does he want babies to get saved? Does he want moms to be spared the lifelong trauma and horror of that abortion? Does he want abortionists to stop killing babies? All of that is true. So I say first is we direct our prayers specifically to the abortionist that's at 123 Main Street, that that place closes. Holy God of the universe, who's created all things together for you. We dislike what you dislike. We hate what you hate. You hate the hands that shed innocent blood. Please close that place and use me as an instrument of your righteousness. It's real simple, but then it gets complicated. How do you know, where do we pick it? Do we have some flyers? How do we preach? I've wrote it all in a book, all of my ideas and concepts and things that have worked and things that haven't worked in my book, Abortion Free. But first and foremost, you have to set your mind straight. You have to align it with what God says. Is it evil? Mm, yes. Is it murder? Are we called to be our brother's keepers? These are simple questions, but they're questions that your church has not grappled with. Yeah. It hasn't wrestled with and come to a final conclusion. We may say, oh yeah, it's, it's not good, but it's not necessarily evil. It may be a necessary evil. It may be something I have mm-hmm. no power over. Another question you might ask is, what part of the universe is God not Lord over? Mm-hmm. What part of the universe is Jesus not king? What part of your personal life is Jesus not wholly and totally given over to? So when you pass by that abortion clinic, you have power over that in Jesus' name. God's given you power over the angels. So pray. Pray for that place. And then wait. I know this sounds simple, but it's also very hard. Uh-huh. Wait and watch what God does. You know, the Old Testament prophet said, here I am, Lord, send me. That was one of my first prayers when I got up off my knees and I said, okay, Lord, I'm a Christian. Where do you want me to go? I'm going to go do it. Yeah. And I didn't think I was going to be doing this. I thought I was going to be a pastor someplace near a beach where I could surf every day or something. (laughs) Instead, he sent me all over the world to do the craziest things. And I wouldn't change a thing. But when you set your hand to the plow of the gospel, I'm going to serve you. God will direct your path. Man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. God will open your eyes. Simple example, one time I prayed to expose a particular abortionist in a particular city. It's written in my book. Lord, I have no idea who this abortionist is. I need to find out who he is. We're literally praying, locking arms. A piece of paper blows between our legs. And I look and I pick it up and it's an abortion intake form. And that abortionist's name is written on the front page of this piece of paper. Now I know. God has revealed the things that were in secret and brings it to light. And we start saying, okay, what should we do? So we found where this person lives and we started flyering the neighborhood. And that person quit abortions. The abortion Mm -hmm. clinic closed. If you pray, God has more than enough means to allow for these things to happen for His glory. Especially in Hollywood, in California. We see all these TV shows, Law and Order. Mm -hmm. They try to depict... Christian as these crazy people like, oh, uh, abortionist uh, got shot because some uh, religious crazy guy. Mm-hmm. And then they're Christian, so they shoot doctors. In, in the TV show, a lot of people think that it is true. With that accusation, could you like help us to debunk that kind right. of... Right. Well, first of all, the wicked man flees when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as lions. They feel the conviction of sin more than we do. They know they're murdering babies. I literally have talked to abortionists one-on-one and... He tells me, when you say abortion is murder, what I hear is murder abortionists. So they're very scared of that. They know because God has convicted their heart that they're condemned based on their actions. They know they're murdering children. But having said that, I believe there's two ways of the cross or two ways of looking at this. One is Barabbas. He wanted to establish the kingdom of God through insurrection and murder and strife to overthrow the Roman government. We know that didn't work. And then here comes Jesus. He lays down his life and goes to the cross and dies for the people. That's the establishment of the cross. So the Christian way is one of peace, one of love, one of grace, one of self-sacrifice, one of self-giving, one of giving yourself up, laying down your life for your friend or even your enemy, loving your enemies. These are all a dichotomy to the world. And we have always preached that pro-life is loving the preborn baby, the human life. Every single person on the planet is created in the image and likeness of God. And to take that person's life without due process, that's vigilanteism. Yeah. That's not pro-life. The mm-hmm. civil magistrate is the only one that can take a human life under the course of law, but not a human being acting on their own passion. That has always been the premise of the pro-life. Does it actually happen? Like 
Christian go out and kill abortionists? Didn't well, I, th there, I think there's the, the think mostly like peaceful two... protests of 2000. Uh, <laughs> there was no murders or strife or, or mayhem, right? <laughs> but that movement was completely anti-God. Yes. And you saw the strife and the mayhem and the destruction and the murders. Christians acting under the power of the Holy Spirit will not do that. But yeah, there's been a few fringe actors, I think, acting out of frustration that have done it, and it's tragic, and we've condemned it from day one. We stand against that. That is not the way we act. But mm -hmm. it's an anomaly. As I said, over 75,000 arrests for peaceful, nonviolent intervention. And over 50% of the American people hold this position. If it was true, there would be abortionists laying in the street every single day, and that's not the case. A lot of Christians, they are scared to step out. Even today in our uh, college uh, a ca canvas. I don't. I don't know what mm -hmm. to say. Like just preaching the gospel. It's, it was beautiful. I don't. I don't know how to describe mm -hmm. it. But I see a lot of students just standing in the backs. And then after we're done, they come up to us and go like, hey, uh, "We're actually Christian. We just want to support you to do, to do this." But for me, I, I just want to take a step back because I don't want people to know my name. I don't want people to uh, know, know me that I'm religious. Uh, I I believe in Christ and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What are your message to those kind of people like who don't want to step out? I've got a message. Um, I alluded to it a couple of weeks ago in my sermon. In Revelation chapter 20, mm -hmm. when the final judgment is all laid out, there's a list of the people that are thrown into the lake of the fire. Mm. Do you know who's listed first? Is it murderers? No. Adulterers? No. Thieves? No. Cowards. Cowardice is, is its name first. I don't think that's an accident. Mm -hmm. Remember earlier it says in the book of Revelation, they, they overcame, speaking of, of the, the Christians, they overcame by three things. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. Hmm. That's what being a Christian is. All Christians are called to believe on Jesus Christ, His atonement, the blood of the Lamb. They are to bear witness. They are witnesses to what Christ has done. And it's unto death, or it's not real. Mm -hmm. There's not two kinds of Christianity, one for real, you know, the courageous ones and one for wimpy ones. No, there's only one faith. And you're either all in or you're not. Mm -hmm. And so I would say to them, yeah, um, you need to count the cost. Not everybody's called to do it our way. Yes, yes. Uh, and yet, in what way are they standing for Jesus? Mm -hmm. And um, you can't just delegate that, well, I'll let the preachers show up or I'll let the other people show up. And, and they want to support us and that's great. And maybe they were there praying for us and we, we appreciate that. But we can't live in the spirit of fear. That is mm -hmm. not of Christ. So, and that's kind of what makes them nervous mm -hmm. is because if we're really, if I'm no longer live, but it's Christ who lives within me, then I'm not afraid of anything. Let me tell you a quick story. When I mentioned to you at lunch, when, we, when I started in ministry, we started behind the Iron Curtain. This is 1979, 80, 81. This was the height of the Cold War. It was crazy. Uh, Brezhnev was the president. Everybody thought we were gonna die the next day in a nuclear holocaust. It was, it was very, very tense. Uh, and if you look at that time, communism was on the march all around the world, Central America, Africa, Asia, it was uh, Jimmy Carter was the president, a weak president, and they were emboldened. And, uh, and nevertheless, by God's grace, I found myself behind the Iron Curtain and I met a young man, his name is Victor. And Victor would travel with us and translate when we were doing concerts and preaching the gospel at very, very high risk. And so the question is, why are you doing this? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you doing this? And he, and he was obviously a very gifted person, very bright. He was in the Communist Youth, Youth League, and then he found Christ. Oh, so Victor is actually Russian, Russian. Yeah, well, he was uh, uh, Estonian. Okay. But he, you know, he knew Russian and uh, all of that. But he was Estonian, and he was in the Communist Youth League. And in that culture, that's how you get ahead, right? That's, yeah. that's where you go. And he was playing the game, and he realized... Everything had changed. And when we asked him, why are you doing this? He says, well, when I came to Jesus, I died. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. 
but that should be true for every Christian, not just for Christians in communist lands, Christians in the West. And unfortunately, we've gotten really comfortable and um, we're now bearing or reaping the whirlwind of the fruit of, of cowardice. Uh, and now we see when Christians step back from the public sphere, somebody's going to fill the void. Yes. And so unbelievers have to fill the void and they're going to come in with all of their unbelieving ideas. It's very simple. You'll either have Christ and his law and his reign rule over you, not perfectly in this world, but through his people who are trying to do his will, who are trying to follow Christ, or you're going to have Antichrist rule over you through his people who could care less about God's will. Mm -hmm. It's not particularly difficult, but that means for most Christians, they don't want to hear that. Because that means, oh, you mean I have more responsibility? I'd like less responsibility, please. I want, my, I want the middle-class uh, American lifestyle, no controversies, and I want to just you know, get my pension and retire. And, and no, we're called to something much higher and greater than that. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's why we're losing our young people. Yes. Right. There's no mess. Oh, just go work for the company, live a, mi a middle-class Lifestyle. Why don't, no, why don't we put everything on the line yeah. and risk everything for Jesus? Young people hear the socialist, communist, ideological uh, message, and they're looking for something, and we have the real thing. The, the kingdom of God and, and picking up our cross and following Christ, that's what we have to proclaim. And I'm, I'm praying that this revival that we hope is starting to start across the country that we've been praying for for decades, mm -hmm. that we will see a whole new wave of, of Christians who will come into the kingdom of God ready to put it all on the line for Jesus. Let me add a little piece to that, and I agree with you 100%. Um, God tells us to disciple the nations. That root word is also discipline. Yes. And a, courage is sometimes, or oftentimes, learned more than just spontaneous. If you want to get a black belt, it's a discipline. You don't get a black belt overnight. Mm. It takes years to get a black belt in any martial arts. It's a discipline that starts a little at a time. So as we disciple the young people, maybe those young people on the campus today, they saw a spark. They said, this is the first time I ever saw anybody in my whole life stand up for Jesus in a crowd of people. I like that. I want that. And maybe that'll give him a little bit of courage to speak to his classmate. Yeah. And come back, and he, now he's discipled. He, courage is learned, and then it's practiced, and then it's implemented. So hopefully uh, what we did today was also encourage those people to step out more in their faith. Yeah. And if I can add one other thing. Of course. Jesus always led from the front. Yes. <laughs> Jesus never asked his disciples to do anything he didn't first do. Yeah. When Jesus comes back, he's not in the back. Uh, uh, he's on the front. He's on the front. <laughs> in the horse, on the charger, he leads the battle. He does not sit in a study in an, in an ivory tower and then come out once a week with some great, wonderful, probably, uh, you know, a lot of pastors do that and they work very hard and it's true and all of that and we appreciate that. That's certainly part of your responsibility. But how can you, with moral authority, call people, and especially men, to act with courage if you're not modeling it? Yeah. So I, I couldn't send my men to the campus. Hey, you guys go do that. No, I had to be there because Jesus leads from the front. Pastor, you need to lead from the front. It, and they don't teach you that in seminary, but that's just the way the world works. And that's what Jesus modeled. And you're going to take risks and they're going to say bad things about you. And if, if that hurts your feelings, then you probably should not be in the ministry because that's what we're called to do. We need to stand and take Take whatever flack comes, but let's bear witness to the truth. We are the salt and the light. Uh, we're the, the pillar and ground of truth. We're to reprove the unfruitful word, works of darkness. I could go on with all the New Testament admonitions, and it starts with the pastors leading. And um, I understand I didn't want to do it, but I could not not do it. I've learned so much from you guys. It's especially what you said was so true. Well, I'm reading this uh, manliness of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then it says, like, Jesus is so manly. So uh, he said, uh, let's go to Jerusalem. And then he lead the way to Jerusalem. So he take everyone's like, hey, let's, uh, I'm about to die. And uh, mm -hmm. let's head there. So he lead the charge. 
and uh, that that's what Christians need to do. Encourage is contagious, and our we can use our life to be the salt and the light of this world, and then we can lead and in front. And that's not just for the pastor; that's for every Christian. I think every Christian should have the passion to do so. My mom told me, "He's like, why are you doing this? You're, you're making like." Peanuts, you mm-hmm. kidding? You have two daughter. What's wrong with you? Why are you? You know, mm-hmm. why, why can't you just get a regular job? You know, like you all <laughs> you used to do. You make way more back then, and now you're like, I I, I need to spread the gospel. I need to tell, tell churches. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to. I have all these topic. I want to mm-hmm. talk about it, but my mom's like, yeah. Why don't you just mm-hmm. just go on Sunday and then uh, have fun? But to me, it's like what you said. I gotta do it. And it's just my passion. So I think that what you guys are doing, go to the college and then talk to those kids. It's so amazing, and that's gonna impact so many Christians. And then we're gonna. This video is gonna do great. Well, and, <laughs> and by the way, this it, this is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and this has got to be clear. This isn't because I'm courageous. Mm-hmm. This isn't because I'm smart or because I'm bold. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, yes, yeah. and the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you're going out in the flesh, and it's that's terrible too. Um, and you saw, we got tested, we got insulted, we were, you know, uh, and we we knew that that was coming, and that's fine. But we would have never done this because we're awesome. Yeah, we're not awesome. Yeah, we serve an awesome God, mm-hmm. and He's given us the, the Holy Spirit. If you look at the book of Acts, the fruit of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I used to be in a Pentecostal Bible college. I know all of the arguments about the charismatic gifts and all of that. But if, as I'm reading the book of Acts, the fruit of the infilling of the Holy Spirit is boldness. Yes. Mm-hmm. Boldness. They were, they were praying, the Holy Spirit fell, and they were emboldened. And so... Pastors, if you're praying, that's what you need to be praying for. Yes, we want the, the kingdom of God to come, but the God, the God of the New Testament uses his, his ministers, and you need to be on fire. And it's got to be the power of the Holy Spirit, or else you'll burn out in the flesh. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. I've learned a lot today. I bet everyone who watched this video is like on fire right now and want to go out and do something. <laughs> so uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. And uh, is there any last words you want to say to our I hope viewers? They're not my last words. I hope they're not my last words. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> go, and serve, go and serve the Lord in peace. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching. This is Ethan. And then I'm here with Pastor Gary and Pastor Troy. Oh, and thank you everyone for watching. Uh, We'll see you next time.